Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. My name is Lieutenant Jaime Castro. I'm with the Laredo Community College Police Department. Um, I've been here for 10 years now. Uh, I started out as a, as a patrol officer and I moved up the ranks. In law enforcement, I'm going now on close to 20 years. Started out in juvenile and uh, did my years in juvenile, worked up to the state, handled narcotics, and uh, went up to the Sheriff's Department. Sheriff's Department, I went over to Constable's office, was a sergeant investigator there, in charge of tactics, patrol, investigations, training. I went to TAMIU, was the first investigator at TAMIU. I was there, and then um, I was fortunate to come over here. Uh, and I've learned a lot over the years. I've taken that training and, and, and I've used it. Um, so now I'm in charge of training, investigations, okay. control, Basic, basically everything that's field operations is under me. Uh, my chief is uh, Chief Ray Cortez. We have 21 peace officers in our division. There's two campuses that we patrol. That's the main campus and the south campus. We handle three shifts. Each shift has uh, three to two officers with one sergeant per shift. There are three lieutenants and of course one, sergeant, uh, one chief. We work 24-7. Basically that means we're here every day, every night, including the holidays. Okay, so we're here, regular police force, just like Laredo Police Department, any other police department. Uh, we handle anything that happens inside Laredo Community College, whether it be at the main or at the south, or anywhere LCC incorporates. For example, the uh, graduation that happens at the LEA, during that time becomes property of LCC, and that's why you'll, you'll see us there. So these are the things that we're going to be discussing. Employees will learn how to handle an active shooter incident. You will be taught the importance of being prepared, how to read body language, how to take control of the situation, how to use objects to barricade yourself, and of course how to run, hide, and fight. Some of you have taken this training before, some of you have seen it online. A lot of these items you can find online. Okay? This is not hard, it's not difficult, it's not something complicated, and it shouldn't be that way. What we're talking today about is an active shooter incident. Okay? These are happening very frequently. We hear about it all the time in the news. Um, you're going to see some stats up there from the FBI. Please keep in mind that some of these stats may be already old by the time we put them up because these incidents happen all the time. Now we're looking at terrorism. Is that a terrorist attack or is that an active shooter attack? Yesterday, uh, Houston, Texas. And again, you gotta understand that these happen every day. Houston, Texas, I think it was Tom Balt uh, Hospital, reported shots fired. Of course, being what it is, you have the blue wave. The blue wave being everything that is law enforcement is going to show up. Uh, that happened yesterday in Houston. The day before, we had another incident. Okay month before we had more incidents. So this is happening every day. And this is not just in the United States. This is worldwide, okay? So I'm gonna ask you certain questions and at first some of you will not raise your hand because you're not sure, and that's fine. I will get you to answer some of these questions. At the end of the whole presentation, some of you are gonna walk out of here with a very different mindset. Some of you are gonna walk out of here thinking, can I do this? I will have to do this. Do I go home and teach this to my mom, to my sister, to my wife, to my husband, to my kids? I'm going to talk about certain things and you're going to start thinking, oh, wait a minute. What if this really happens while I'm out at HEB shopping? Has it not happened at HEB? Has it not happened at Walmart? Has it not happened at the malls in San Antonio? Has it not happened in churches, synagogues, mosques? So I want you to keep an open mind. I don't want you to panic. I don't want you to be scared. I want you to be open-minded. We use this fear to educate ourselves. So on an average, a uh, number of active shooter incidents in a two-year period. Again, look at the data. So you'll see that in 2000 to 2001, look at how many incidents. 
2002 to 2003, look at the big jump. <coughs> and you see it as it keeps on going. We're already in 2017. Where do you think this is at? It's way over here. <coughs> These happen, like I said, regularly, every day. They're happening in schools. They're happening in colleges. They're happening in universities, hospitals, everywhere. Are you prepared? Are we prepared to handle something like this? A lot of people, when I've gone to these trainings, have said, I never thought I'd be in the middle of it. I never thought I would see this. I never thought this would happen to me. I never thought police were just going to walk by me and not help me because I was shocked. I didn't know what police did. And they walked away with a different idea, different mindset. What is your mindset on this? How are you going to be affected by this? What are you going to do when you go back to your classroom, to your workspace, where you work? Are you going to look at that area differently than you do it now? Am I going to be a victim? Am I going to be trapped here? What do I need to do to make myself not a victim? How am I going to get out of here fast enough? You know, when that Orlando airport one happened, mm -hmm. I don't usually look at those videos, but I did. And it was amazing how people didn't know what to do. Exactly. And I found myself stuck saying, what should I have done? Some of these people were hiding behind things that you couldn't even hide. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like those little things where you carry your stuff. Yeah. And, I didn't, and at the end, I didn't, real, I didn't know what was the right thing to do. Hopefully with here. Some people just dove to the ground. I said, maybe that's what some people ran. I don't know if that's a good idea because the shooter could shoot them. And some people just didn't know what to do. Yep. They froze. And, and everybody's going to react differently because we're all different. But there's something that human beings have in common. Do you all know what that is? Does anybody know what that is? So we'll go back at that. And I'm going to ask you. So what is an active shooter? <laughs> So according to the Tactical Police Officers Association, FBI, the active shooter is a person or persons who are solely intent on causing mass murder. Active shooters are not interested in ransom, money, or valuables. They want to carry out murder and send a statement. That's all what active shooters are. They don't care about what you're wearing. They don't care whether you're rich or you're poor. They don't care. They have a mission in their mind. <coughs> And that's what they're going to carry out. Okay? They're not going to take you hostage and get money. Because they know that once they start killing people, all bets are off. Okay? And they've seen this themselves. Just like y'all are getting training, guess what? Internet gives them the training. And they'll see it. Some are going to try to outdo the others. Now, as we go through this, we're going to talk about the history of active shooter incidents in the United States. And although there has been an increase of active shooter incidents in the United States and around the world, it has not always been recorded as such. And that's true. If we go back in history, in the previous trainings that we were giving, we were giving examples of uh, incidents that claimed the lives of innocent children, innocent people. And I'm talking about 1900s, 1800s. And it, there's no such thing as an active shooter. People were labeled as what? Crazy. How can you go blow up a building with children inside? This guy was insane. Looking back at it, you start looking at these common denominators. What are the common things that these people have? So in the late 1990s, 1900s, acts of violence that took the lives of several people were never classified as active shooter incident. But in 1966, we're seeing what? the first ever active shooter incident. Now, we didn't know. We didn't know. Does anybody know what that is? UT. We had this individual who was trained by our government. Now, there is a, there is a movement that's going on within law enforcement and victims of active shooter incident, where we don't name the individuals that caused the damage, the heart, the casualties. So I'm not going to name these individuals. I'm going to try not to name them because they don't really deserve the credit. Okay, You're going to see pictures of victims, families. Those poor people are the ones that affect them. 
1966, we saw the first active shooter incident. It took place in Austin, Texas, at Capitol Hill University of Texas. The, in the incident took, took the lives of 17 innocent people and injured 31 others. The shooter was, at, was eliminated. However, according to the timetoast.com, the first recorded active shooter incident was in August 20 of 1986 in Edmond, Oklahoma, where 14 people were killed, not including the shooter, who was a disgruntled postal employee. And I remember, because in 1986, I, I graduated from high school in 1985. 1986, I went off to, to Kingsville College. And that, we started hearing about all these postal employees, right? Oh, and it yeah, became, it became this joke. You've gone postal. And that's what we were hearing, all these postal employees. But yet, look, in 1966, we had the first one. Now, this individual was trained. He was trained by our government as a sniper. And he was well prepared. And some of you who attended this, this presentation by the ranger, uh, Ramiro Martinez, he ex explained in detail how that incident happened. Yet... It was never classified as such. Okay? It wasn't until 1986. After that, again, like I said, we hear about all these postal work related uh, shootings. And, you know, it wasn't up until recently that timetoast.com labeled it as such. What do these people have in common? They didn't take victims, they didn't demand money. They went and made a statement. <coughs> they fired me. Uh, I was working here for you know, 20, 30 years. I gave you my life, and this is what you did to me. And they go in there, and they're going to kill people. That's the one, what they're the one Did he want to die? I got the impression that that was not intent, his intent to die. So the guy from UT will, and again, from a lot of these shooters, we'll never know, because they usually either commit suicide or they're going to go out, what they call guns, guns of glory, blazing, right? But interestingly, this guy, again, he was pro, uh, former military, so he was well prepared. And in his in his uh, belongings, he had food, he had rations, he had all this stuff. So what does that tell you? He was prepared for a long battle. Okay. Again, this guy was a military guy. He was prepared. Was he ready to commit suicide or be killed by cops? Or we don't know. Um, I doubt that he was willing to give up. He had food, he had long rifles, and he had a lot of small arms plus knives. So he knew he was going to come into contact with somebody. He knew that there was going to be a confrontation, so he was prepared. He knew he took that post, and he was taking good shots. Okay. Since 1986, there have been active shooter incidents every year. And every year, this incident claimed the lives of innocent victims. And the most common denominator is the shooters most always commit suicide. Some of these incidents take place at areas where the victims are the most vulnerable. Most recently, these places are changing. And that's true. Um, what is the first place that comes to mind when you hear of an active shooter? What place? School. Schools. What kind of schools? High school. Elementary, high schools. Why? The little kids. The kids are vulnerable. Plus, what is it? You come into a door and you see a big old sign, right? It has a gun with a slash, meaning, hey, no guns allowed, right? So these people know where they're going. Now, are kids going to be able to fight back? No. What is the first instinct as an instructor, as a teacher? Well, to protect your students, to hide. So all these shooters knew what they were doing. And I'm going to talk about some of them, that they knew exactly what they were going to go do. Now, let me backtrack a little bit. I asked, what is it that we all have in common as human beings? And these active shooters are going to prey on that. Fear. 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 Curiosity. Fight or flight. Fight or flight. And that's the most hardest thing for us to do. We are all curious individuals. How many of you have heard gunshots? Actual gunshots? Raise your hand. Do they sound like actual gunshots or do they sound like firecrackers? Firecrackers. Depending on the type of caliber weapon, right? Were you in the military? 
What army? Army? Yeah. Infantry or? <laughs> Thank you for your service. I appreciate it. The juicy service. Uh, you know? Unless you've been in service, and unless you've been in law enforcement, then you know what I'm talking about. Most of us have never heard of actual gunshots. Some of us have never shot a weapon. You'd be surprised how many police officers who are police officers right now, when they go to the academy, have never held a, ga a gun in their hand. They've never shot one. As an instructor, that's great for me because I can teach them the right way, correct? But those of us who have never heard gunshots, what are we going to do when we start hearing... <laughs> are we not going to stop and say, is that actual gunshot? What is that? Yeah. Have you heard the difference between a 22 caliber weapon and a 40 caliber weapon? Can you tell the difference between a 223 round and a 308 round? Unless you're trained for it. If you've never been exposed to it, you wouldn't know. Curiosity is going to get you. There is a video on the previous one that we showed where there was an actual uh, shooting going on, and people stopped and said, wow, is that really gunshots? I'm going to show you pictures of one of the survivors that I was fortunate to meet from the Naval Yard shooting. Now, the Naval Yard shooting was blasted throughout the whole TV. Everybody saw it, right? Guy with a 12 gauge shotgun. But we also were being told it was an AK-47. Now, if you're familiar with weapons, it was not an AK-47. It was a shotgun. Two different, two different weapons. Okay? But curiosity will get you. What's the difference between the two that they're so different? One's a shotgun, one's a, a big round. Uh -huh. Depending on the type of round that you can use, you can use bird shot, you can use double lot rounds, which are bigger BBs, or you can use a slug, which is a big piece of lead. The other one is basically a bullet, and it's a faster round, it's a high penetrating round. The army uses it. Okay, uh, it's a fast, very fast round. It's basically coming out of an assault rifle. Okay, is that one? Uh, they're both, they're both very, very uh, lethal weapons. They use properly, yes. Uh, in the hands of, of, of somebody who knows how to use it, yes. Um, but curiosity will get you, because you're going to want to stop to find out whether that's actually gunshots or not. What am I going to do? Am I going to run towards a gunshot? Or am I going to run in the direction away from gunshots? Which ways are we going to go? You need to know your buildings. If you shoot a gun inside a hallway, will you be able to tell which way the, it's coming? Yeah. No. Unless you're trained for it. I see Ramiro looking at me. Yeah. I'm going to just follow him. Because <laughs> you're trained for it. But sometimes even police officers can't tell. The echo will bounce off the walls. Okay. Uh, which ways are you going to run? Do you know the building? Do you know the layouts of your building? How do you know you're going to run into a dead end? And how do you know that that exit that you're going to run into is blocked? Or the shooter won't be there, or they're booby trapped it. Now, the active shooters really have to have just guns? No. No. Could they use knives? Yes. Can they use a car? Yeah. Explosives? Yes. So it's no longer just that rifle or that handgun. An active shooter can use anything that is at their disposal to cause what? Mass murder. And if they're going to drive their car into a crowd like we've seen and they have explosives, then you just doubled it. The Boston Marathon. Everybody said the bombs didn't go off the way they did. They were supposed to. Yes, they did. In the military, if you take down one guy, how many guys is it going to take to take him out? To take that one? Do we leave somebody behind? Never leave someone behind. Even if that person is dead, you never leave that person behind. So how many people is it going to take you to take that body out? Two? Maybe three? Maybe four? We carry a lot of gear. So imagine being shot, and I have all this assault gear. How many guys do you think it's going to take to take me out, to carry me out? Four. 
So did those explosives do what they were meant to do? Yes. They were packed with ball bearings, uh, nails, shrapnel, because they did exactly what a uh, explosive is supposed to do. Take out as many people as possible by maiming them, hurting them, destroying them, whatever. Those bombs did exactly what they were supposed to do. And they carried out effectively. Okay? So please keep in mind that curiosity is going to get you. <coughs> do we know where we're going? We need to know the layouts of our building. How many of us go to the same building day after day after day? Uh, pretty much a lot of us, right? I see Ramiro walking all over the place. <laughs> but then again, Ramiro's pretty much aware of a lot of the buildings already because he's been here for quite a while. And if you're not familiar with other buildings, and let's say you're, you're, you're sent to the Lewis building. Has anybody been to the Lewis building? Or never been? So do you know where the exits are? Do you know where the exits are at the case? Oh yeah, they're the glass doors. Are those the only ones? No. We need to get familiar to these buildings. When you go to the HEBs and Walmarts, everybody goes in through the main entrance, right? Do you check as you go in? As you're walking to your car, are you talking with someone? Hey, you know, did you see this price? And what do you think? Hey, did you see that crazy guy over there? What, hey. But are you checking around your area? No. You're not. And we're all guilty of it. I've had people say, Lieutenant, you're a cop. You're trained that way. Yes. And guess what? My daughters are too. Okay. We need to start looking at that. How we carry ourselves each and every day. I mean, you, know, you see a lot of students every day. Every year. For how many years? Uh, oh, about 30. Would some of them stick out to you and say, whoa, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and say, man, there's something wrong here. What do I do? Do I make that call? Do I not make that call? How many times have you sat there and said, uh, do I make that call or no, oh, let me give him the benefit of the doubt. And then he leaves and you're like, Man, maybe I should have reported. So what we're asking is that if somebody sticks out and it's 110 degrees, guys, and they're wearing this trench coat, call us. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I stopped an individual. Coming out of the, uh, Lerma Peña was under construction at the time. It was summer. The individual was wearing a hooded jacket, black. And he was grabbing the girl and pushing her along. This just didn't fit right. It's 110 degrees, or 109, 105, 100. 90 degrees in Laredo is hot. Can you imagine wearing a hooded jacket with a hood over? Something just doesn't click. Turn around, stop them right by Lerma Peña. Okay. As I stopped him, he became very aggressive, you know, very belligerent. He didn't want to be questioned. The girl didn't want to be questioned. But you could tell that once you separated both of them, there was something there. What was there was that he was taking her against her will. Okay. There was issues going on there. But he had threatened her. So when you see something strange, you need to call us. And a lot of the people that have encountered some of these active shooter incidents and terrorist incidents, they don't report them. Because we're so used to what? Carrying on our daily lives and not looking. Yeah, minding our own business. We can't afford to do that anymore, guys. We can't. How many of you have kids? Okay. Do you talk about this to your kids? I have teenagers. Well, take that back. I have one daughter who graduated. She's off on her own. I still worry about her. And I have another one who's at a university. And I worry about her. Do you talk to your kids about, hey, be careful if you're here. Be careful if you're there. Watch out when you go to the movie. See, they're not 
looking at what might happen because they're carrying on their normal lives. Some people say, no, we don't want to get them scared. It's not that you're scaring them, it's that you're educating them to what the world has become now. How many of you go from your car, wherever you're at, to the Walmart and put your keys in your purse? What's the other thing in your head? I can almost guarantee what's in your head. The phone. The phone. <laughs> I've seen girls and men too because men are comadres. <laughs> going like this and going and, and here comes a cart. Almost ran the right through through here the fifth. Do you carry your keys in a certain way that will protect you? No. Because why? You're not thinking of what's gonna happen. I did when I was coming from the where I was exercising. <laughs> I but because you got scared. And I was ready. Because yeah. you got scared because it was dark. Yeah. But if it wasn't dark, then you're yeah. comfortable. I'm cool. Yeah. <laughs> How many carry your keys in a way where you're going to protect yourself? That's what I do. These may not kill anybody, but I guarantee you hitting somebody in the face with it is going to hurt and it's going to stop that potential attack. And I'm going to show you certain things of how you can defend yourself with the simplest of things. But if you don't think like, hey, nothing's going to happen, you don't prepare yourself, you're just asking to be a victim. That sounds exhausting. <laughs> Today, terrorists and active shooters are the same. However, depending on their objective and their mission, one can see this in some of the tragic events that have occurred recently. And again, I'm only mentioning these. Now, from the time this new presentation was put up to now, that's history. That's old. From about two months ago to now, new developments have come up. But Orlando, Florida. And I put that one up there because at the time there was a lot of confusion. There still is. Does everybody know what Orlando, Florida was that? That was a guy who traveled? Airport. Airport. He knew what he was doing because he packed his weapon. He cased the area, he patrolled the area, he saw what his targets were going to be, and then he carried out his attack. Was it a uh, terrorist or an active shooter? Active shooter. Active shooter. But they started going back into his origin, his demographics, his, oh my god, he's a terrorist. He was actually an active shooter because he was casing out the place. Now, can some of these active shooters be terrorists? Yes, the same thing. San Bernardino, California. Were they terrorists or active shooters? Terrorists. Terrorists, terrorists that became active shooters. Why? How can you differentiate that, uh, Castro? Because look at their radicalization. They became radical. Look at, if you look at the big picture, and you start investigating. Now, I do that as an investigator. But you start looking at it. Did these people prepare themselves? Yes. Was <coughs> this meant to happen on that day? No, it wasn't. Something triggered him. Something happened. The one in San Bernardino? Yes. Oh. Something happened that triggered him, that upset him, to cause him to go back home, get his stuff, convince his wife to go and carry out this attack. And he carried it out. Did anybody find out what it was? No. Uh, they didn't live to, to tell us. Because they yet. shot it out with law enforcement. I mean, you're going to see that. Where these people, they're not going to go and then be captured. Unless, hey, you know what? I'm going to outdo Ramiro. Ramiro, Ramiro got killed. I'm going to outdo him, but I'm going to write a book and I'm going to make money. And now I'm going to be more famous than Ramiro. You see, those are different intentions. San Bernardino, these guys, this, this, this couple, carried out this assault. But they had been planning for it way in advance. They even had somebody, an accomplice. Well, I think that guy was just not the smartest tool in the ship. Really. If you look at their weapons, and, and if you're familiar with weapons, these people had modified their weapons, correct? You saw them? <coughs> These people were prepared. 
this wasn't just regular weapons. They were prepared. They knew what they were buying. They knew what they were carrying. They knew what that bullet, that round, that ammo was going to do to people. They knew. And in the end, they didn't give up. They shot it out with law enforcement. They shot it out. You're going to see pictures of them. I was fortunate to meet some of the people from San Bernardino, some of the officers, to a training that I went this past summer um, in San Marcos. It's an alert training for instructors. And there I got to meet several of the survivors from active shooters, train incidents. I got to meet the officers that were involved in it. Let me tell you something. Whether you're the officer who responded or the victim that survived it, you're traumatized for life. Um, if you've never seen battle, you don't know what I'm talking about. I have experienced some things in my life that when I go to sleep, I don't think you really want to wake me up. <laughs> you know, kind of have to be at the end of the room and kind of, hey, get up and, and tell me a couple of times. When you've been through these situations, you're scarred. You're scarred for life. And I've met some of these survivors. And let me tell you, uh, as a father, you hear these young girls talk about their experiences. And you sit there, and you're holding it back with a room full of tactical guys that are all like this. And you don't want to shed a tear, but you have to because you're a human being. And you hear these stories. You hear the stories from police officers that see these things. You gotta remember that these people, these active shooters, they don't care about you. They don't care whether you survive, they don't care about your son, your daughter, your family. They don't care about that. All they care about is the taking out as many people as possible. Fort Lauderdale, Florida, same thing. My only question is, here and here, and here, but basically here and here, because this is in Turkey. What happened to security measures? Last week, did anybody hear the news last week about these 20 people that got on the uh, runway in the airport? What happened to security there? But I love TSA's response. We have different levels of security throughout that are not seen. We have canines. How can that be? We're lucky that those 20 individuals were not terrorists because what happened in 9-11? Weren't these individuals that got in these planes terrorists? Did not they get on these airplanes? Were they not training on how to be pilots? Didn't we go through this extreme of TSA guidance and all these rules and laws and policies, which you can't even take shampoo in this size because it's a bomb. <laughs> but yet, 20 people went through security and weren't even checked. They got on an airplane, boarded. Where was this? Um, JFK. JFK. And the response was, JFK is a very small airport. I've never been to JFK. I've seen pictures. I've heard the traffic. And I, I don't know. But JFK, I understand, is one of those airports that have a lot, has a lot of security. So what happened there? I'm going to go back to that incident like J, JFK. So we have Monterrey, Mexico. Anybody know what this is? Everybody saw it? private school. Everybody saw the video? Has anybody seen it? Somebody hasn't seen the video. I don't want to see it. If you haven't seen the video, it's a very graphic video. You can look for it on YouTube. I don't know if YouTube still has it. Probably does. You do has no YouTube has really no filter. What does it show? Um, so what this is is a video. This is an elementary school in Mexico. This young man, student. I want to say he's about eight or ten years old. I'm not sure. I don't remember. He was thirteen. Thirteen? So this young man pulls out a weapon, and I believe it was a 22 caliber revolver or hand, or a semi-automatic, I'm not sure. Uh, the video is kind of grainy. This young man is sitting at the far end of the, of the room, he's against the wall, and all of a sudden something just triggers on him. The teacher's talking, okay? And please excuse me for now moving around because I got the camera in the back. Uh, so the young man gets up, and if, if I'm wrong, please raise your hand and correct me. Young man gets up, the first thing he does is he aims at the teacher, hits her in the head, boom, she goes down. He goes down, boom, boom, boom. Somewhere in between here, he ran out of ammo. But what he did next proves that this young man, as 13 years old, was intent on carrying out his mission. Very calmly, he goes back to his backpack, 
reloads again. While the rest of the students, now, these are all 12, 13 year old, I, I don't know, but these are kids. And they're seeing this, and oh my God, can you imagine the child looking at the, at the teacher there with her brains out, blood all over the place, another student. And while he's reloading, students are going crazy trying to get out of that classroom. One door mm -hmm. to get out. Funnel, fatal funnel, going out. Students are running, they're panicking, they don't know what's going on. And he's telling them, Salganson, get out. And he's loading. And he attempts to go at it again. The last part is he commits suicide. What was going on in this 13-year-old's mind to do such an act? Think about it. Could we not have that happen here? Yeah. Could we not have a student sitting in front of somebody, an instructor, financial aid, counselor, anywhere, and all of a sudden just snap? And now we become a victim. What are we going to do? And that's the whole purpose of this training is what are we going to do? Now, there's going to be some times where we're just going to say, Castro, you know, what do I do? If I run, where do I run? If I hide, how do I fight? Hide. And can I fight? Somebody said fight or flight. That's going to be very hard for us. Very hard. And in that case, those kids were going to run, but they did what? Remember what I told you about curiosity? Those of you who've seen the video, there's one little girl that goes like this. Yeah. She didn't know what to do. She was curious. Well, what do I do? The curiosity. Is this real? Where do I run? Do we not know the layout of our room or of our buildings? Do I fight? Or do I flight? What do I do? Brussels, Belgium, 31 uh, killed. Bombers. Okay, they become their own human bombs. The reason why I put it on there is because I want you to see that it's, this, it's not just a handgun or rifle. They're IDs. Okay. Um, Claymore mines. Ramiro, you know what Claymore mines are? You can make them. Thanks to this thing right here. You can make bombs. And that's how the Boston bombers created their bombs. Because they were trained, they were rattled, rattled, they were trained, and they got the information off the web how to make it. Turkey Airport, three bombers. It's a statement that they want to make. Now, active shooters or terrorists? I can guarantee you that those are terrorists. If you go anywhere outside of the United States, um, those of you who travel outside of the United States, anybody gone to Europe? In Paris, France? I mean, I have friends of mine that go to Cancun and like, what are you doing? What happened in Cancun not too long ago? Same thing. Same thing. Um, much we, we used to see it every weekend. Yeah. Well, it and you know what? Uh, I worked the WBCA detail. I'm in charge of the dignitaries. I have the security detail. Several years ago when we started doing <laughs> the setas. Everybody was shocked. But this was been going on for years. But when that 48-minute gun battle lasted, I was taking care of the lieutenant governor. And we stayed up till meetings till 4 o'clock in the morning. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, I had to be at the bridge. So we didn't sleep. For them, this was something they had never heard. But just like you said, it, this has been going on for years. But it finally hit the news. These two, these, these are terrorists. And we see it now more every day. At least, at least, uh, there's been studies saying, and you can find this on the internet, that there's between three to five incidents of active shooters going on in the United States or throughout the world every day. The reason why you don't hear it as much, because Paris Hilton or Kim Kardashian is probably more important than people getting killed. And that's just the truth. That's the truth. 
okay? Kim Kardashian's jewelry being stolen in, in Paris was more important than people uh, being killed. And if it's an off day for reporters, then we'll go report on this. That's the truth, folks. The following will be pictures of active shooters. Now, I put that on there. There's some graphic images. You're not going to see anything that is not uh, on, the, on the web. But I put it on there. And I'm going to go over some of these. Now, remember, what I want you to walk out of here with is the run, hide, and fight. We want you to run away from an active shooter incident. Be careful with curiosity because it'll get you. If I'm going to run away and I ask her, let's go, and she says, no, I'm not going to go, I'm going to stay here, am I going to waste my time trying to convince her? No. And that's what you need to do also. Is you need to say, you know what, I'm sorry, I'm going. Because I have, I have a family, I want to live. If I'm going to hide, and I'm going to show you pictures, how to hide. How can I barricade myself in here? If you're going to fight, which is the last thing we want you to do, is because... Remember, folks, these people are out to kill you. And if I have a weapon and I'm going to come and I'm going to kill you, I'm dead set on killing you. And you have an opportunity to defend yourself. Are you going to do it? Or are you going to say, take me? I want you to think about that because we all act differently, especially after you see these pictures. Now, Sandy Hook, how many of you here are instructors, teachers? Did you all teach um, elementary school students? No? So when I started out in my law enforcement career, I was fortunate that I took a small break and I went to go work for UISD. So I wasn't always a cop, folks. I was a migrant coordinator for UISD. And has anybody seen that kindergarten cop, that movie? Yeah. yeah. That was me. Um, I taught one day of kindergarten school, pre-kinder, and I'll never do it again. I actually went home, and I fell on the bed, and I said, never again. But the reason why I bring that up is because those kids were under my protection. They were under my care. Look at these kids. Look at their faces. Do you think this little girl will be the same ever again? And thanks to everything now and today's media and the computers, these images are up there for life. I met the detective that went into Sandy Hook. And uh, if we find the video, we'll play it. This detective was the first one that went in, and he saw these casualties. And I can tell you right now, this detective will forever be traumatized. He spoke of it. And he, when he spoke of it, you could hear it. Some of these teachers went into bathrooms and shielded their own kids, their own students with their bodies to protect these children. Some of these teachers died while doing that. Remember, when these kids were walked out, guess where they were walked out from? Right by what? Dead bodies. Uh, she made a comment earlier that she said, man, I didn't know that police officers would walk right by injured people. There's a big misconception that when we go in, if you're down on the ground and you're bleeding, I'm going to stop to help you. I can't. My main objective is for me to stop the threat or the threats. Once those threats have been eliminated, then the secondary unit will come in and start giving help to the ones that are injured. A lot of people didn't know that. And I bring that up because I'm going to mention pictures of a young lady who thought exactly the same way. And she was upset. Not to use the word that she used. But she was upset. How dare you? You're a police officer. You're there to help me. You walk right by me. But she didn't know. 
She didn't know what our job was. Now she says, I'm thankful to you because I didn't know. I was also fortunate to meet the parents of a young lady, beautiful young lady, and I'll speak of her, who lost her life in an active shooter incident. And now those parents go out throughout the country and they speak on behalf of her, on behalf of their daughter, to train people in active shooter incidents so they can become familiar with them. Look at that. You think this college student thought about, this is what's going to happen to me for today? Uh, I believe this is in Boston. Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech. I have several. Uh, and again, there's so many of these, it's hard to keep up. Wasn't Virginia Tech that we started the texting after that, that we were getting texts for it? Virginia Tech set a precedent, yeah. and Virginia Tech paid for it because they didn't have an alert system. The alert system was not there. And because of that, we started getting alert systems. Um, and which is why this young man was saying, you know, the new laws. And it, yeah, the problem is that the federal government doesn't give us the funding to upkeep these laws. It's very difficult. Virginia Tech. This young girl, I met her. She did a presentation. Um, she graduated, she now has her degrees, beautiful young girl, she's about this high. And so a little bit about her. She said, you know, my mom and dad always raised me to, to dress a certain way, be very proper, be very polite, be very ladylike. And she said, you know, the only thing that I worried about that day was, oh my God, my mom is saying that I'm wearing flip-flops with socks. She survived it. But in surviving it, she had to deal with alcoholism and drugs because that affected her. Are we prepared for that with our own students? Are we prepared ourselves to deal with something like that? Every day, I make sure that I call both of my daughters to ask, and I'm pretty sure they're going, yeah, leave me alone, I'm fine. But to me, that gives me, okay, I can breathe easy. How many of you have girls? So I'm getting, that's why I cut my hair short, because of the comments. I heard about my son, too. <laughs> and you're right. And that Mother's first you're a yeah. guy doesn't mean that you're not exactly. going to be careful. Until yeah, <laughs> but we always have this perception, you know, guys, you know, se defender and girl. But... There have been instances where guys are the number one target, rather than the girls. So anyways, this young girl, she survived it. She took several bullets, and she survived. Uh, after Virginia Tech, she graduated, and took her a while. She went through counseling, still going through counseling. And now she goes on and does presentations. But she'll tell you, I will forever be marked. People see that, and the first thing that's scary is these guys dressed in black. And we've gotten criticized. Where's that? Um, you know, I really don't remember, to be honest with you, and I apologize for that. Again, there's so many of these, it's hard to keep track of. We've been criticized for the equipment that we use and how we look. We look too militarized. But I want you to understand that that helmet will not stop a 223 round. That helmet will not stop an AK-47 round. That helmet will not stop an explosion. We've gotten to this because of what's going on in this world. But our most important, valuable is this, those kids. That's what we train for. Oh, well, see, my daughter was at UT and the <coughs> shooter was there. That he didn't tell anybody. But the second one? Yeah, yeah, we call it the second one. And I called her to tell her that I got an email that there was a shooter right in here where she was at. But uh -huh. she didn't, she said there's nothing going on. So she asked the officer, can I leave? Because my mom is saying that there's something going on. Yeah. And he said, we haven't gotten orders that you can't leave. So I made her stay. I go, I don't care what happens. But um, she said it was very scary. What happened with that guy? Everything, all the protocols were in place. 
everything happened. Really good, yeah. That's why students didn't know what was going on because the protocols that were set in place worked. And that's why that student was not able to get off one shot. There's actually a video in here that you can see it. He goes into one of the libraries. He's got an AK-47. Yeah, he, where he was at, my daughter was leaving one building to go to the other building because she had a test, and he was in that vicinity. Mm -hmm. And I found out about it before the security there, and he was going to let her go. And I said, you know what? You're going to have to listen to me on this one and stay put. Yeah. And then later on, it was, yeah. It was and you know what? Um, you're going to hear me say about some of these kids where they're actually calling the parents. I cannot begin to imagine what those parents must have been going through to get some of these text messages or calls from your own child or saying, you know what, I love you. You may not hear from me again. Okay? So when you get a phone call like that, of course, I, I wouldn't know what you went through. I wouldn't know. And God, I hope I never get to know what that feels like. Well, I thought it was but, better to be safe than yes, sorry. Because you were saying, well, the officer said I could go. I go, no, no, I just got this email. Don't. Now, let me, let me just caution you on something. We as parents, we always want to know that we're right, right? <laughs> but if an officer tells you stay in place, folks, stay in place. Us as parents, we want to always dedicate. We all, not dedicate, delegate. We always want to do that. Trust your kids. And it's hard, especially when they're in a big university and we're here. It's hard as parents to do that because we do that as parents. You gotta trust your kids sometimes. My daughter's at, at A&M, another huge university. And um, A&M has had their things. Recently, I'll tell you about my daughter in a, in a bit as far as, but you've got to trust what they've learned and how you raised them. They know, okay? And I don't speak about that one because she got involved in two incidents. This is San Bernardino. Now, San Bernardino, this, these people knew exactly what they were doing. They knew their, their objectives, they knew their victims, okay? Um, San Bernardino had all these protocols in place, <laughs> but like a lot of active shooting incidents, they fall apart. So what happened in San Bernardino is that they started using the roads as staging area, and traffic was a mess. Traffic was a mess so much that first responders couldn't leave the area because everything was bottlenecked inside. So San Bernardino learned from their lessons. Uh, met two of the uh, main uh, lead detectives on that one, and they also learned. And they, and they said, hey, you know, we had the city spent all this money and all this training and all these procedures, all these protocols, but we had never tried it, and it fell apart. But look at the injuries that these people sustained. This was right around Christmas. They I would have assumed that this, it was a state agency, right? But they should have had also some protocol, just like we do here. No, it was not a state agency. It wasn't it, it, No. Um, this, it, it, you got to understand one thing. If something happens here, it's not only going to be LCC police. There's going to be Laredo Police Department, there's going to be Border Patrol, there's going to be Customs, there's going to be everybody that has a gun and a badge is going to come in. Yes, sir? Um, how many officers can we expect to be on campus at any time? Is it two to three? Between two to three per shift. Okay? Yeah. And believe me, that's not enough. Okay? <coughs> if I have two officers on shift and one calls out sick, guess what? I only have one officer. This patrolling. So that means I have to go out and patrol. Okay. Not only patrol, but supervise and do my other work that's administrative. We've been asking and asking and asking for more manpower. But again, manpower costs. This comes first. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. I may not be here tomorrow after saying that, but it is true. Okay? Ramiro knows exactly what I'm talking about. Education comes first. And it's not just us, folks. This is in every education setting, okay? So this is San Bernardino again. 
You tell me if they were going to give up. That was where they were driving. This was after leaving the house the second time. You remember, they went to the facility. Something triggered it. He went back home, picked up all his stuff, went back to the facility. They did their shooting, killing. They left the facility. They knew, okay, they're going to be on to us. They missed each other by minutes. Okay? They went to the house. They prepared, and as they're coming out of the house, PD spots them. Now, they didn't give up, okay? More active shootings. Again, I'm not going to name them. Does anybody know who this is? Virginia Tech. This is Virginia Tech. That, that church. Mm-hmm. And these two, uh, this guy also became an active shooter, went into one of the schools. This guy as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, this guy is the one who had some, uh, I think, uh, some ladies held in his house hostage. And prior to that, he had some active shooters. So there was warrants on this guy. I want you to see how him and him, um, so he out, tried to outdo, and he did outdo Columbine. So if you get on the web and you look for this guy, and again, I'm not going to mention him, and you look how he dresses and you look at the two guys who call him by dress, he's dressing almost exactly like them, but he's outdoing them. Because in one of the pictures, he's got this assault vest, which is a tactical vest that law enforcement agents use, you know. You've got all these pockets. The more stuff you can carry, the better. Then he's got the same tactical pants for more pockets. You can carry more stuff. What are you carrying there? More rounds, more magazines, more clips. The weapons that he picked, he knew what they were. You see one with an extended magazine. Okay? That means that it's not just a normal magazine, now it's an extended magazine. Okay? He was prepared. You see him with a knife, ready. You see him with gloves, those gloves have beads inside. Why? Those are assault gloves. Okay? This guy, he knew what he was going to go do. And he went out and he carried it out viciously. Okay? And Is he picked... Yes. But he picked the weapon, exactly which weapon he knew was going to do the mass damage. It was a force of the These are the faces of some of the victims. And this is why we don't mention the names of the active shooters. Because these poor innocent children, their names are never mentioned. Only the ones of the active shooter. And to me and others in law enforcement, that's not right. I cannot, as a parent, and every time I look at this and I talk about it, the hairs on my arm stand up. Because as a police officer, I've taken a note to protect these lives and your lives. But when it comes down to these folks, look at those poor kids. I want you to understand one thing. Imagine the 2 2 round hitting one of these kids in the head, hitting them here. And this is what the detectives saw. I want you to know that because this is the brutality that these active shooters have. They don't care about you, about your children. They don't care about that. It's the brutality that they're going to carry out those mass murders. These are the teachers that gave their lives protecting children. Every time I see this, again, I get them. <coughs> I'm trying to hold it. Because are we not supposed to protect our children? There's a saying entre mexicanos, los papaces no deben de ver a sus hijos que se vayan primero. Can you imagine what they must have gone through? To be sitting inside a, a Senate committee hearing and telling them, I want you to change this law. Convincing lawmakers 
to change a law. Now, I'm going to talk about laws in the state of Texas. These are the people from uh, the Naval Yard shooting. The shooting that occurred at the Naval Yard, what similar to uh, Naval Yard. Do you all see NCIS? Anybody see NCIS the show? Yes. Okay, Annapolis, Maryland, um. where the Navy has their deal over there. So this guy is a uh, black male who is a contractor who has a permit to go on board into the facility. Okay. And this gentleman, prior to him going into the facility, <coughs> shows up at a convenience store wearing his Islamic, his traditional Arabic, whatever you want to call it. I don't know what it is. It's all in white. And if you're not familiar with their religion, he was cleansing himself before this attack. Okay? Um, he goes in there. He has a pass. You can see this on video. Goes into, into the area. He's got a backpack. And in the backpack, he has a shotgun. So once he clears that area, he goes in and goes into a room and comes out with a shotgun. This, this naval yard building... Um, and again, I only know of it because I, I, I heard the, the, the survivor, I heard of the individuals that were there, and I saw the pictures. It's a huge, huge, monstrous building, okay, which used to be a warehouse where built, where ships were built, and it was converted by the U.S. government for offices. So he goes in there and starts taking lives, starts taking bodies with a shotgun, folks, okay, with a shotgun. And, and you don't really survive from a shotgun, especially at close range. Young lady right here. Uh, survived it. So this young lady started telling us her story. Her father works in the same building where she is. So she's sitting with her boss in her office. And she starts hearing these shots. And then everybody's like, oh my god, what is that? Curiosity. Can't be gunshots inside the naval yard. Can't happen. Turned out that it was him shooting people. So she starts hearing all the screaming and stuff. So she makes her way out. Now, as she's making her way out, this young lady is an athlete. But she had hurt her leg, and her leg was in a cast. So she's running as best as she can. Now there's cameras inside this building. Captures all of this. Captures the, the gunman going from room to room. Taking out people. So as she's running, she stumbles. She stumbles in a corridor with basically a dead end. As she stumbles, the gunman comes up, gets a shotgun, points it at her, and pulls the trigger. The shotgun didn't go off. Because he had shot somebody else before and he didn't rack it. So if you're not familiar with shotguns, if it's a, if it's a pump, a semi-auto, you got to pump it every single time you shoot. So he had shot one person, but he didn't rack it. Meaning the shell was still inside, the empty shell. It didn't dispense, and the other one didn't go in. So when he pointed it at her, it didn't go off. So he racked it. And shot her again. But this time it didn't go off. Because it didn't hit the primer for one reason or another. So he gets it. She's looking at him straight in the face. And he tells her to leave. Now she's wearing cast. He goes off and starts killing people. He racks it again. It goes off. She makes it up. They meet up again in another corridor. Okay? Again, she falls. She says, I gotta pretend like I'm dead. But he saw her. So she pretends that she's dead. He goes up, pulls the trigger. Didn't go off. Second time. Well, like third time. Third, well. So he leaves because he sees 
police are coming. Okay? So police are coming, he leaves. And he goes into a corridor. So cops are coming. It's a huge building. Okay? There's several teams going in and out. Miscommunication. So as this team comes up, one of the officers coming around, he pulls and he sees, and she looks, oh my God, here's another one gun in my face. <laughs> now, cops are going to show up to these incidents without uniforms. Can you tell who's a cop without a uniform? No. You just see another gun, right? I'll throw, oh my God. Cops, she, says, she sees he has his badge down here. Finally, they take her out. She's taken out. As they're taking her out, one of the cops goes like this, looks around the room, but he didn't see this room. So as he's turning, guess who comes up from behind? Takes out the cop. And she sees all of this. During all of this, she also mentions that she made her way back into her boss's office because her cell phone was dying on battery. This young lady has been through a lot of trauma so far, right? But during all of this, before she was being saved by cops, she makes it back to her office, her boss's office. She goes up to the boss. My goodness, the lights were out. She kept nudging him, nudging him, nudging him. Not realizing that he had been killed. She contacts her father. The father's in another office. Can you imagine what he's going through? They're communicating. Dad, I love you. Dad, I love you. I love you too. Be safe. Be careful. Stay there. All this. Father survives. She survives. Beautiful young lady. But she survives and she has to deal with what? Trauma. Trauma. And the way she survived it, and she went and she said, I do. Alcohol and drugs and counseling. Now, when I went to this training, this was the very first time she had ever spoken in public. She had never spoken in public before about that incident. And as she's talking, she's seeing all these videos. She's running through the video, folks. The actual footage. She became very emotional. And I could not even begin to imagine the strength that she had to gain to speak to a bunch of officers who she said, I thought you were there to save me. I thought you were there to protect me. When you walked by me and you put a gun in my face. She was the one that said, I was always told officers are here to protect me. And it's not until afterwards that she realized, now I know why you do what you do. Now I know why you walk by and you didn't help me or you didn't help somebody else that was shot. Now I understand. And that day that she did the presentation, she thanked everybody in law enforcement. And we actually stood up for her and thanked her. Because to stand up in a room to speak of the event that changed your life forever, that takes a lot of guts. Especially to be seeing this on video and reliving it over and over and over. And she admitted, I'll always be in counseling. I'll always be in counseling. But at least now, I do it with less pills and less alcohol. And that takes guts to admit, you know what, I have, a, I have a problem. And she's a runner. She's an athlete. How do you defend yourself in an active shooter incident? Well, in the past, we showed you a video of how to protect yourself. But everybody wanted to know, okay, how do I do it? I don't get it, Castro. I don't get it. How do you want me to, to, to protect myself? How, I don't get it. How do you want me to barricade myself? So I said, all right, rather than me having to tell you, all right, let's all pick up chairs and desks and let's just pile them over there and the week that will take care of it afterwards. We found pictures. And she looked at me over there like, you better not even think about it, Castro. These are just some images. Can you protect yourself in a room like this? Yes, you can. In every group, there's going to be one leader or two leaders. And in every group, there's going to be people that panic. That's just our nature, folks. And our nature is not to fight unless we've been trained to do so. But I guarantee you, some of you 
are going to fight with one means or another. It's the will to survive. These are just images, how do you protect yourself? Get desks, chairs, pile them up on top of entries. Do you know how many entries and exits are in this room? For example, I believe there's one there, and I think there's one somewhere over here, one over here. Could you? So what if we barricade just one entrance? Uh, what about the other ones? How do we protect ourselves? How do we barricade ourselves? So here are images. Folks, it's going to take everybody's work to come together. Okay, so we're in this room. There's a lot of cords in here. And I'm looking in the back of Lupita's set. There's a whole bunch of headphones. Um, a lot of wires. Could we not use that to tie the door to a table like that? They're not going to open it. If we stop the threat, we've survived. Now, I'm going to show you a video where an active shooter is going to go in there and he's going to try to open the door. And if he can't open the door, he's not going to waste his time. Folks. He's going to go to the next easy target. So why not get creative and lock doors? Do you have that inside your office? How many of you have your desk right here? And the door's right there. And no mirror, no nothing. Here I'm looking at this reflection. I see the gentleman over there in the corner with the, the glasses who asked me about the 911. And then I ask the other gentleman over there, this is the very back, he's got his hand on his, on his uh, chin. The young lady's grabbing her ear right there with the glasses and a gray shirt. I can go all the way further back where the other gentleman is back. Do you have that in your office? Women, how many of you, I'm pretty sure all of you do, what do you all do with those cases where, where the makeup comes and there's a mirror? Do you throw it away? Yeah. Sell it. Give it away. My officers, I tell them, hey, you find those, pick them up, bring them over here. Because we use them. And they, I have to teach them, just like I'm teaching you. Are we prepared for something like that? If you're going to interview a student, do you let somebody else know? I would hope that you do. Do you leave the door open or closed? Well, if it's a sensitive nature, we might want to leave it cracked <coughs> open. But I'm going to notify you, well, not going to you know, he's got an issue. Just let you know I'm going to be here. Folks, we need to start letting the other people know what we're doing. Um, you're still teaching the uh, petroleum class? You're still teaching petroleum and, and oil and gas? And yeah. safety. So here I am, a student, I'm taking one of your classes, and all of a sudden I just hear the oil and gas program is just going down. I wasted my time, wasted my money. You promised me you were going to give me a job. Now, now Lewis Energy is not even hiring to be a sweeper at the, at the office. Did you not promise me? Sure, let's go to my office. Yeah, you close the door, time. here's a more building, and that is just one place I wouldn't want to be. How prepared are you? Well, all of those in our office, we can't lock it from the inside. <coughs> from the outside. Okay. Now. So when they do these buildings, don't they look like it? Unfortunately not. Unfortunately not. Some buildings, when they were built, that was never taken into consideration. Um, anybody remember the La Rafa? I'm pretty sure yeah. you didn't remember La Rafa back then. There was a, a little corridor. You could barely fit. You could barely fit. That perception was not there, folks. Some of these buildings that were built recently, you can still go in there and it's like, oh, wait a minute, where's the thing in here? Some of these doors that were installed are, are heavy doors, but they're not being used properly. In other words, you're not closing them, you're leaving them open. Um, if you have a classroom and it's a solid wooden door, close it, folks. Close it. You've contained your area. If you're talking to a student and there's some issues there, leave it open. Talk to somebody. I'm going to be interviewing <coughs> the student. Please know. So somebody can know. If you have your desk facing in an area where it's just not conducive to you safety-wise, change it around. Get some mirrors. Do something. Use reflection. What's going to be your backup plan? What's going to happen? Do you leave your purse exposed? Do you carry a knife in your purse? Do you leave it exposed? What are you going to do with this new law that's going to come into effect August the 1st of 2017? I'm going to talk about it. What are you going to do when that comes in? 
This is an active shooter drill. Again, uh, why are they wearing masks? Because they're going to get shot with pepper balls. <laughs> hey, balls. Um, I'm kind of still hoping that LCC will want to do that. Don't put me in. Uh, it's really exciting. The officers get into it. You know, uh, we we go through that. But you know what, folks? It's not until you go through it then you're really going to realize, wow, this is what adrenaline really feels like. This is what it's what it's like to be scared. Even though those are pepper balls or paintballs, you're going to be scared, and some people just can't handle it. Okay. Being creative again. That's why they're wearing these masks. Is he not tying up the deal up there? Yeah, he is. Um, somebody said this looks like the warehouse where all the electronic old computers are at. I don't know, Mr. Eden, what do you think? <laughs> can we take all of this and, yes we can, folks. You're not gonna get fired. You're not gonna get fired, you're not gonna get in trouble. This is an active shooter situation. This is protect yourself. If you didn't run, then barricade yourself and hide yourself. How to use concealment to your advantage. Okay. So, concealment. All right. So you didn't run. Now you're going to barricade and hide yourself. Well, you better hide yourself pretty good. Curiosity, right? Y'all look at this other picture. Where do you see curiosity? You don't want to peek out and see the shoes there? You see them? Oh, my goodness. Right there. These are all ladies. You're telling me these ladies can't defend themselves? Oh, yes, they can. Ladies can defend themselves. Um, I've done it before, and I'll do it again. <coughs> can I borrow this? All right, so this is pretty heavy. If I stand just like that lady, and here comes this gentleman right over there, and it's me, and I'm going to whack him. I'm not going to kill him, right? But I'm going to knock him silly, right? Couldn't two or three or four or six of you or all of you jump on him? Yes. Did you stop the threat? Yes. yes. Because chances are you're going to stop the threat before we will. Not because we're being lazy, but because you're there. You become creative. Which I wonder with the school in Monterrey, why they, all the kids didn't just jump on this kid. Because they were scared. They were scared. They were scared. You're talking about 13 year olds. They don't know. Maybe one of them Remember, all of these kids are taking direction. Over there, they don't my, my nieces and nephews are in the next classroom. Uh -huh. So they never got trained. They never, anything. Pretty much all, all they know is this happens in the, on the streets. Yeah. Not in the school. Exactly. Except private schools school. are training them now. Well. Now, I'm going to talk about our schools here. I hope I don't get in trouble because the camera's on. But let me, let me finish with this one. Can you fight with this? Yes. Yes. In the face, <coughs> in the eye, in the ear, in the throat, wherever. You're going to go several times. That's true. Can this be a weapon? Yes. I'm going to grab it so hard, I'm going to hit somebody. Now, I'm not going to kill them, but I'm going to hurt them. Folks, you can use anything in here as a means to protect yourself if you decided to fight. Now you have the concealment, they're hiding, he's made his way, and they're gonna attack him. You see, what do they have in there? First. Sprites, Sprite bottles, water bottles. That's what that is, it's a Sprite bottle. She's got something else, but those are Sprite bottles. If you have a water bottle, that's, and you hit somebody with it, it's gonna hurt. I guarantee you. Curiosity is gonna kill you all the time. Why are you there? There's a video that I showed it the last time. And it's a board meeting going on. Curiosity. Oh, yeah. If they tell you to leave, leave. Yeah. Why do you come back to the scene? If you're going to fight, commit to it and go through it. Concealment. Cover. Turn off the lights. Why are you concealing yourself when the door is cracked? Tie it up. Oh, no, sir, yes, sir, because a handle is one of those that go, yes, you can. Get creative. I bet you all of us here have a belt or something. We can get a, 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 some cord and tie it up. What she said makes a lot of sense. People were not being trained. Kids are not being told to do this. Why? No los queremos, no los vamos a asustar. But yet you've become and you've made them victims. So I'm going to show you um, a video 
the first one is going to be the uh, run, hide, and fight video. This video is the one that we want you to walk away with. And it details of what to do. And I want you to look at it, and then we'll go to the next one. Can you all hear? But sometimes bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. The warning signs may vary. The devastating effects are the same. And unfortunately, you need to be prepared for the worst. shooter event. Your survival may depend on whether or not you have a plan. The plan doesn't have to be complicated. There are three things you could do that make a difference. Run, hide, fight. First and foremost, if you can get out, do. Always try and escape or evacuate, even when others insist on staying. Encourage others to leave with you, but don't let them slow you down with indecision. Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind and try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you're out of the line of fire, Try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911. Oh. <laughs> if you can't get out safely, you need to find a place to hide. chosen randomly. The event is unpredictable and may evolve quickly. The first responders on the scene are not there to evacuate or tend to the injured. They are well trained and are there to stop the shooter. Your actions can make a difference for your 
your safety and survival. Be aware and be prepared. And if you find yourself facing an active shooter, there are three key things you need to remember to survive. Run, hide, fight. So this video was done with uh, the Department of Homeland Security in conjunction with the Houston Police Department. And it's the video that we've used and has been approved by administration and the board. Uh, we want you to go back and remember, we want you to run away from the threat, if at all possible. If you're going to hide, we want you to hide and maintain that concealment by turning off your cell phone, turning off the lights, barricading the doors, do whatever you need to do in order to maintain that concealment. And if the last thing is for you to fight is that fight and flight mode, then we ask you that if you're going to fight, to commit to your actions, follow through with it. That is the most difficult thing for us human beings to do. Because by nature, human beings are not aggressive individuals. We don't want to fight. We, we avoid that. But if you have no other ulterior means of survival, and it's up between you and that person, then you need to fight to survive and you carry it out. Remember folks, this is an active shooter situation. Nobody's going to sue you because you, you, you were trying to survive, you were protecting yourself or others. Okay? Unfortunately, we live in the United States where everybody can sue everybody else. All right, But you have to survive. If your friend or coworker doesn't want to leave, don't waste time. Keep on going. Leave your valuables behind. If you're going to call 911, we ask you to let us know where you're at. Tell us where you're at. What you hear, what you saw. Don't make it complicated. Remember when I started saying some of you may not know the difference between a 22 caliber and a 40 caliber? Some of you will see a small gun and think it's a gun this size. Some of us will look at blue and say it's black. Some of us will mix the color. It's not your fault. It's the mind what it's doing. It's trying to take all that information and process it. And unless you've been trained to do so, if not, it's going to be difficult for you. I'm going to show you another video, and it, it's not as long. I'm going to cut it in half. But before I do so, I want you to see, uh, when we started seeing this, this press today, the Run, Hide, and Fight, I talked to you about the schools. And you'll see on the door, it has those stickers that say, no guns allowed, right? No weapons allowed. How many of you go to schools and you drop off your children or pick up your children? Now, I'm not going to mention schools because the camera's on me. But how many of you have gone to schools, press a button, and there's a door chime out there, and there's a little camera? You pressed it, nobody answers you, and they just open the door. How many of you have gone through that? Lots of time. So then what's the purpose of having that camera in that deal there, right? I could, be hold, I could be standing to the side of her with a weapon on her side. I could be her jealous husband or jealous boyfriend, and I'm telling her, I want to see my son. And I'm forcing her to go open up to that school, and I'm to the side. They press the button. They don't ask her anything. They just open the door. She goes in, and I'm right with her. Now, she's fearful that I'm going to hurt her and hurt her kid. Is she not complying with her fear? Yeah, she's not complying with what I'm saying because I'm the one in control. So I question that. Why are these schools not doing this? Now, I'm not going to mention this other school, but I'm going to use the example of this one. And because both my daughters are no longer in the school district. But I went to one of these schools. And every time I'd go in there, I'd press a button, bang, the door would open. As soon as I made my way to the other school, to inside, there's a desk. There's a desk, and there's a paper. It says, please sign in with security. There's no security guard. There's a metal detector, which I can go around. So why are we allowing this to happen? Again, we're paying tax dollars for this, OK? Why are we, as parents, not questioning administration? Why is this being done? And I guarantee you that the moment you start questioning administrators, why is this not being done? You're going to get some heat. Okay? I've gone to the schools in uniform and out of uniform. And when I'm out of uniform, I always carry my weapon. 
Why? Because I just never know what's going on nowadays. And maybe because the security guard knows me, he allowed me to go in. But how could they know I'm an actual cop? Just because I have a badge and a gun? I could buy that here downtown. Well, sometimes you're not even locked. No, sometimes they're not even locked. Now, I was one of those parents that I used to go and complain about. There's one school where I would go in. The plastavas, it wouldn't even work. I just opened the door. I'd go in there, there's a security guard. <laughs> Sitting down. Hello, sir, if you're going to that's fine. But on the other side, it's open. There's the other door. I don't have to go through it. It's door. Folks. We need to start speaking up for these kids, for our own kids, for other kids. We need to start training them. We need to start being a little bit more alert in our daily doings. When we go to HEB, when we go to Walmart, when we go to church, when we go to restaurants, how many of you sit this way and the door is this way? How many of us now? Some of you are probably going, but you're paranoid me now. I'm, you know, what if that's the only table? <laughs> turn your, there's nothing saying that you can't turn, turn the table. They're still going to serve you because they still want your money. Okay? <coughs> Folks, start training your kids like this, like the young lady said back there. We need to talk to our kids. Let's educate them. Of course they're going to get scared. But you don't think they know about this? They do. When you go back to the classrooms, when you go back to the students, when you go back to areas, I want you to go back and look at your workstations. Are they safe enough for you? Do we need to do some modifications? Now, please understand, don't go over to administration and say, I want you to build me this, because that ain't going to happen for you. But you can do minor modifications to your office. <coughs> okay? Yes, sir? I teach at oil and gas at all the high schools in United. The weakest one is Alexander, nine inch schools. <laughs> <laughs> all the way to LBJ. I take my briefcase, put it on the side of the uh, metal detector, and I walk through it, and it goes off. Show them my keys, but don't even look at my briefcase. Kids come into some of the classes, especially, well, I'm not going to mention any more high schools, they'll put the backpack right there and the hand up. So right away, I know my escape route, what to do, where's the desk. It's dangerous out there. Anybody's students, I know there's some students right here. When did you graduate from high school? Did you experience some of this in school? Yeah, we do not have LISDs or UISDs? Uh, north or south? I, I don't want to name schools. Okay. <laughs> you? Did you go through some of this? No. no. So you see the, the difference? If you ask students, they know. When I started doing presentations a long, long time ago, I'd say, okay, students are like prisoners because they're there more time than they are at home. And they know. If, you were, if I was to sit down and ask, hey, tell me, was this and this going on? Oh, yeah. She knows more about it than the cops do because she's in there. Folks, you need to go back and you need to talk to your, to your kids, grandkids, and instill this education in them. You'd be amazed. Now, I'm not going to mention schools, but you kind of hit it on the uh, Where I experienced this, I worked for USD for five years, so you can't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. I spent those five years, four years in administration in the administration offices. So I know exactly what I'm talking about. You need to go back and look at your work areas. Because in August the 1st, 2017, the LCC is going to go under the campus carry law. What does that mean? That means that a person who's 21 years of age and has a license to carry a weapon can bring that weapon on campus carry it on themselves, whether it be a holster here or a holster here. Carry it in their backpack. As long as the backpack stays on them like this young lady has it straddled right there close to her leg. As long as the weapon stays in this woman's purse and it's right there next to her. 
Just August the 1st, 2017, that lock ends into effect. Now, we've already been tested on it. Um, Ramiro, I don't know if you knew about it, several weeks ago we had a call of a male student inside the bursar's office that appeared to have a gun. It was not the caller's fault. The caller had not been trained. Have you all been trained? We can't call you. <laughs> Have you been trained to say, was the gun exposed? Was the gun being pointed? Was the gun being shown? So I'm letting you know right now, precursor, way ahead of time. If you are a supervisor, if you are in the process, if you have the ability to train other people to go back and make a difference, ask your supervisor, well, what are we going to do if a student comes in my classroom and I see a bulge? What do I do? Do I call campus police? The question has always come up is this. Will campus police know who's carrying a gun? No, because I'm violating that person's rights. Remember, it's concealed carry, folks. We're not supposed to know who's carrying. If I'm the concealed carry person, I bend over to get something from a backpack, I have a sport coat, I have a jacket, and then you, this young lady sees this, am I showing my weapon? Yes. Well, technically I am, because I bent down, right? But did I take it out and say, hey, did you see my brand new gun? I just bought it last time. No, I didn't. Did I point it at her? No, I didn't. Did I make it accessible to anybody? No, I didn't. But it's going to scare people. Of course it is. So what are you going to do? But question, even though it's going to be allowed to carry a gun, can you prohibit it to carry here? No. no, we cannot prohibit anyone from carrying a weapon who is licensed to carry. We are violating their First Amendment rights. But you suspect in the classroom that you're experienced. You can ask me politely. No, sir. Person. No, sir. You're no, violating the right and you will get sued. But I don't tell them I know you have No, sir. Time. No, sir. Listen to me, folks. Listen to me. You cannot go and ask people, are you carrying a gun? I don't care if you're the president of the college. You cannot. If you do, you're going to get in trouble. So I can carry a gun and no one's going to ask me if I have. As employees, exactly. Exactly. Until, until you use it. If you carry a weapon and somebody reports you, hey, you know what, I think she's carrying a gun. Well, I'm going to have to go up to you and first of all, I'm going to ask these questions. Did she expose it? Did she point it? Did she make it known to the people? Was she threatening somebody with it? No. I'm going to have to be very careful to go up to you and say, hello, ma'am. Lieutenant Council of Campus Police, how are you doing? Listen, they called me and they said that you possibly have a gun. I do. Okay. Yeah, but you're not asking me if I have Exactly. Yeah. I, I do it, that's all you can do. Mm -hmm. You see where our hands are tied. Uh -huh. Folks, these are your legislatures. These are you. This was your governor that, that put these laws into effect. Now, just like students have the right, guess what, folks? So do you. So if you have a concealed handgun license permit, you can take it with you. I can't tell you. You can carry it with you. As long as it's not exposed to the, the same way as students. So anybody can carry a gun now. As long as you have a concealed handgun license permit. Now if you don't, if, I don't have the if you don't, then you're facing a criminal charge. But you can't ask me and I don't have to. Exactly. I need to have reasonable suspicion and probable cause. Yes, sir. Oh. I was going to ask, how can an officer find out if you don't have a license? Under reasonable suspicion and probable cause. If I used it or pointed it, then they can, I guess. So now, just, let, so me, just, let me throw you a curve. So yes, this is a catch-22 situation. Exactly. Okay. Now, I'm going to throw you a curve. On the state tables right now is a bill proposing, and this is a different animal, but it's going to, <coughs> if it passes, it's going to change things around open carry without a license. Oh, yeah. oh. So what does that mean? That means that Ramiro goes to Walmart and purchases a handgun. He passes the ATF's background check. He passed the government check. That's all I need. If it passes, it's on, it's, on the, it's on the tables right now, folks. This is why you need to contact your senators, your representatives, your state legislators. This is why you need to contact them. When this bill came out, the day it was approved, 
the head of the Dallas Police Department, the head of the uh, Houston Police Department, the head of the Austin Police Department, the head of the youth, all these major police agencies were on the Capitol. Because let me tell you why. We couldn't go and we couldn't go and ask, period. So then they said, okay, yeah, we can. But then right as it was voted, it was backtracked, and now I have to have reasonable suspicion. Catch 22. I have to have reasonable suspicion. If I don't have now reasonable suspicion, not probable cause. Reason now. I say probable cause because it kind of gives me a little bit more. Right? But reasonable suspicion. Now, if I go and ask you, and, and <coughs> did I not violate your rights? Well, yeah. Couldn't you turn around and sue me and sue the college? Yes. That's why I gave yes. you a false answer. I can't tell you. Yeah. Now, the, the, this is the good side of it. For those of you who do have a concealed handgun license, you've gone to training. It's cost you money, right? And you've done it the right way, correct? Supposed to be. And a lot of these instructors are saying, hey, listen, if a police officer goes up to you and they ask you, hey, do you have a concealed gun license? Yes, I do. You comply. 99% of the time, the people that have the, the license to carry a handgun have gone through the right training. If they didn't, they're in violation. Very simple, plain and dry, black and white. The instructor that's teaching these classes, and there's many of them, will say, listen, just comply with what the law says, because if you don't, then you're going to lose that license. And folks, it costs money to get the gun, to get the training, to get the license. Just like students will have that right, so will you if you have a license to carry permit. Okay, I wanted to throw that out to you because come August the 1st, it's going to be tried. It's going to be tested. Now, are we going to get trained? I hope so. No money. I, I, I don't know yet. I'll be honest with you. I don't know yet. Um, I'm on the committee for the campus carry, but I don't know where it's sitting at right now. I don't know uh, if it's at the attorney's office. It's supposed to be presented before the board and the president. I don't know. We've done a presentation to several students, to faculty and staff, because it, it is required by law. But I don't know where it's at yet. It hasn't been approved for the safe zones. Now, there's going to be safe zones. Isn't the board supposed to decide Yes. That? There's going to be safe zones, there's going to be advertisement, there's going to be notices placed. So it's not just, you know, random. There's going to be notices. There's going to be certain areas that are off limits. Anybody work at the daycare? Well, you're lucky because... They can't take at the daycare, now, again, I'm, gonna, I'm getting off a little bit off topic because I'm going to go to this. At the daycare, there's right now, there's a challenge saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're saying that you can't carry a gun inside the daycare? Well, I'm challenging that. So they're challenging that, yeah. okay? They're challenging. But I, I'm throwing that out there so you can know, precursor of what's to come. Now, the next one I'm going to show you real quick is, do we have it there? Yes, uh, I'm hoping that Okay. Is. I'm only going to show you very little because I want you to experience what it's like at a university. This is a, a, a video that was done by the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. In the event that we don't get it, you can find it online. Um, <laughs> Can I find it? Okay. Yeah. Um, this this video was done by the FBI out of several active shooter incidents. Sorry. <laughs> Find it online. It's called the storm. Um, let's see if you can find it or not. Look it up. And what it is, the FBI did their own production. YouTube. 
sat in his car and was giving his manifesto why he was going to kill people. That's where he's getting that from. I told the dean that that individual needed to be brought in. Uh, that individual was never brought in. No, he's not here. Uh, folks, if you see stuff like this, you need to let us know. You need to report it. Did you just not see me here? Oh, we're going the wrong way in the first place. Okay, come This is what we deal with every day, you know. Capital Police. My husband is going to freak. Well, so is my mom, so thanks for that. Hey. I'm when I saw this, I remembered my daughter in college we'll days. 30 minutes. Will you be ready to go when you're done with the test? I still have a little packing to do. Tara. Mom, I didn't have time to pack last night. I had to study. This is a really tough class. Sir, you know we have to be at the party by three, and there might be snow coming. That's coming from the young girl that was at the Navy Naval Yard saying, Dad, I love you. I love you, Mom. Please remember I love you. This is coming from an incident that happened with a young girl that I'll tell you, tell you in a minute got killed. The young girl that I'm talking about was a student, beautiful young girl. She ran up to this guy. He was in the library. He brushed up against her, hit him accidentally. The guy was sitting down, had a trench coat, and he was loading a shotgun. He turned around, she walked away, she said, I'm sorry, she walked away, turned Take the shotgun the and blew her head off in the back. Take the shot. <sighs> this had better be important. Where? David, come on. Injuries? What about the shooter? Who's on the scene? This is our worst nightmare. Okay, get a hold of tactical. Call for mutual aid. And make that perimeter wide. I'll be there in 10 minutes. Okay, everyone, put your bags away. Please remember to put your names on your test. You'll have an hour for this exam. Modern world, they'll find out before we will. Say something. 
Curiosity. Curiosity. His relationship with his parents. I'm not sure. I know he's been a troubled kid since middle school. I'm sorry, I have to go. There's been some sort of shooting at the university. Agent said this will stay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have to go too. Can we get news on that? Oh, yeah, sure. sure. Where do you run? Where do you go? Curiosity. Is that really gunshots? I'm looking back. How am I going to hide? Concealment. the young girl naval yard remember i told you call the president's office tell them to put out an incident alert i want it out on all social media and i want everyone waiting to wait for east campus i need to take this give me some good news mary i'm so sorry i just got the word how the roof how can we help i've got one and possibly two shooters and i've only got eight misinformation i haven't talked to wilson and state police I'm Young man said, how many cops are going to show up? Everybody that carries a gun and a badge is going to show up, even outside of uniforms. Jesus. Mary, what do you have? Sir, I just got off the phone with Paul Stan, the new chief at Appomattox. How bad is it? What's he name? There's at least one shooter and multiple casualties. We'll put you on the speaker. The chief only has a few on shift, so he asked if we could send tactical evidence collection and agents for interviews. He'll need immediate help and victim assistance, too. Tell the chief we'll send two evidence teams, tactical and agents, on the way. Have you spoken to headquarters yet? Yes, sir. I confirmed with PSYOP that there was a shooter and that we have someone on the scene shortly. Mary, Metz and his people will be on their way to you shortly. Sir, I'll connect up with evidence and get them too. Good. Pull three trim squads in the JTTF and get them rolling along to help with interviews. You can always send people home if we don't need them. Yes, sir. Don will stay here and coordinate with SIOC. Headquarters will want to have a critical incident conference call soon to see what assets we might want to mobilize and support. Lavelle, call me when you know more. I'm on my way there. Yes, sir. I'll be there in about five. <laughs> Images that look similar to Columbine. Two-man unit. That's what we have. That's what's going to go in and take care of this situation. That's what we train for. How dare you didn't stop to help me. You're the cops. I didn't know what you were supposed to do. That's from San Antonio. The female officer took the uh, major out. San Bernardino. 
traffic jams. Uh, Aurora, the uh, theater, same thing. They had a program going on, they had policies, everything fell apart. This trip was. Thanks. Payments. Fred. What's the status, Denise? We have a shooter down. Dave Whalen's been hit, but he's coming out under his own power with Lynette. We know we have injured kids inside Longfellow Hall, and there were unconfirmed reports of a second shooter and possible bullet strikes in the science building. Vince, can you get that checked out? Sure, I'm on it. Can you get someone else to do it? I want all the commanders here with me. Right. Fred, what do you have? I've got 20 troopers inbound from Division 2, and I can get more if you need them. Great. Thanks. Great. We have two ambulances, one site, and one on the way. Command post to 10 minutes out. Good. We'll set up unified command here. Do you have tactically trained EMS? We do. And that's what we're going to get. Good. Tactically trained EMS. Good. We have two officers who are going to be going to the training starting in August. Right They'll be training the trainers. Uh, Marta Cabrera and Officer uh, Fidel Valles. It's your show, Carl. Vince, we're here to support you. Look, we're going to need all the help we can get. My people are just not getting the long guns out of the locker. Long guns out of the locker. Okay, let's get a Up until recently, uh, LCC bought us several long rifles, but to purchase ammo, I've had to buy everything I could to be able to get ammo. Why? Because everybody has a different perception. Um, I, I know I've talked to Mr. Inigas here, we've discussed it several times. Folks, you need to go back and you need to talk. I know we've talked about being trained and stuff like that. This is where you all need to go back to your department and say, hey, are we trained for this? What do we need to do? Capital Police going to take care of this. How do we do it? We need your support as well. Phone lines are going to be tied up, folks. I imagine LCC. for the police officers from the departments to see this so you can see what we need to be better at and trained at. This is reality folks. Two officers went in, regular patrolmen, took care of the uh, hostage situation and then the SWAT team comes in afterwards. Remember I told you, the secondary team's going to come in and take care of the injured and that's what they're doing. Common thing. Everybody says the same thing on I haven't trained with this guy. That's why everybody's training at different levels under the same type of program. Let's do this. Rescue task force. But didn't the carrier take him down? Yeah. So this rescue task force is going to go in and take care of the injured. Why did you not take care of me when you were coming in? You saw me bleeding. How come you didn't? Shortly after this, I'm going to stop it. I just want you to see what the parents are going to go through. These are the injured. There's your rescue task force. Those are your NT. See the phone? We know this is going to happen. We just don't know when it's going to happen. And I pray each and every day, you know, that it doesn't happen. I told you, everybody's going to show up, whether they're in uniform or not in uniform. Federal guys are notorious for this. They'll show up in plain clothes, beards. Everybody's going for a beard now. Uh, you'll see them. Houston, yesterday I saw the footage. You saw these guys with helmets and beards. Like, are we in Iraq or where are we? But these are federal guys. These are these are feds. 
This is why it's very important. When we tell you, come out with your hands up, let me see your hands, let me see your hands, we ask to see your hands. Because you won't know if whether I'm a cop in plain clothes or I'm another shooter. You don't know. Now, I won't know whether you're a shooter or you're not a shooter. That's why you were given ID tags. And I look around and not a lot of people carry them. Those ID tags are valuable property because I know you're a secure employee. And as much as you're going to hate to hear this, that's how am I going to identify a dead body if your face has been blown off. Okay? Miscommunication. One shooter's down, we're chasing reports of a second shooter. There wasn't any. Miscommunication. Is that through media? That's through media, that's through the students, confusion, the adrenaline. All this is going on, folks. Did you hear that you say that there's like a second shooter? Chief, Chief, I'm going to ask you about They run to these directions. They're going to meet up with law enforcement. And we're going to tell them, hands up, let me see who you are, who you are. That's where these IDs also come in place. Listen to the, listen to the miscommunication. Even though the shooter's down, this is not over yet. We have to deal with everything else. Parents are going to show up, guys. Parents are going to show up. Especially they found out, hey, I think it was at the Moore building. Ooh. Maybe it wasn't at the Moore. Maybe it was at the Martin building. Maybe it was at the Memorial building. Family members are going to want to know. So they're going to show up. I don't know how many of you give your phone numbers to students. But they're gonna, parents are going to be calling you. And what are you going to do? Remember, there's a policy. You cannot give out information. For a ball. Okay, you need to be careful of that also. A lot of people think that an active shooter is just one thing. But there's so much more that goes along with it. And as employees of this college, we are bound by these policies and procedures. Folks. I just want to show where the parents, um, I don't know if we can, can we forward it a little bit? Can we forward it? Do you know where it is? Right there. Go back a little bit. A little bit more. More back. A little bit more back. Right there.
IDs, that's what I told you about the IDs. Can you move it up here? Uh, yeah, just a little bit more and more and more. more. See, just get some more. More. Right there. Go back a little bit. Go back. Go back. Right there. 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 Right You gotta excuse me when I see this part. Um, it's hard as an officer to see this, even though this is a movie. But I've been fortunate to go to some of these trainings and hear some of these survivors, young girls. And as an officer, it's hard to put that into perspective, even though I've dealt with death, and I've dealt with suicides, and I've dealt with shootings, and I've dealt with stabbings, and I have been a victim of stabbing, I have been a victim of three attempted shootings. I have had family members killed of family violence. But when you start seeing this, and you see the parents affected, you see the young kids, the children who are now grown up, and they're talking about how they survive, it gets to you. It gets to you because you're a human being. I wanted you to see that because if you have no feelings over that, then something is wrong. And that's what active shooters lack. They lack the compassion and the, and, 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 and the love that they have inside for humanity. These people don't care. I want you to walk out of here knowing when they, they don't care about you and me. They don't care about your families. They, they are committed for one thing, that's mass murder. They will kill as many people as possible. It's going to be up to you to go back and prepare yourself for an active shooting situation. Run, hide, and fight. To go back and teach your family what to do in an active shooter situation. Whether it be at home, at church, at the mall, at HEB, or Walmart, wherever you're at. How do you prepare yourself? What do you do? Okay. Here, when you go back to your workstations, how are you going to modify your workstation? What are you going to do? Get together with an employee. What's going to be our plan? It doesn't have to be complicated. It is all of our job to be trained. I can guarantee you that, God forbid, something like this happens. Ramiro's going to be involved because he's a counselor. Mr. Ine is going to be involved because he's got all this techno stuff. I don't know what your other workstations are at. Lupita is going to be involved because it's under HR. Everybody's going to come together, and we have to work together. But we also have to train together. It's very important that you go back, and if you have an incident, you have a student, you have somebody, a co-worker, that something's just not right, let us know. You need to get involved, folks. Don't just say, no, you problem. Like if um, I get out at six and that's it. Set at the other office and they're young, yes. that might be appropriate for somebody to call Catholic Yes, police. by all means, wait call us. Counselor to tell them Don't them wait. Them. Don't wait. Call us. If you see students arguing, if you see co-workers arguing, let us know, <laughs> folks. Let us know because it may be something that's going to explode into something else. You know, and, and we don't want that. So, in closing, I hope that everybody goes back and, and, and understands. We want you to run away from the threat. If you're going to hide, we want you to barricade yourselves and not come out until campus police or law enforcement comes in. Silence all phones, turn off the lights, barricade yourself. If you're faced with only one alternative, and that is to fight, then you carry it out. You fight to survive. Question. Thank you so much. I appreciate it and have a safe, safe day.